Hello everyone and welcome back to the Apollo Tutorials in Reentry and Orbital Simulator version 0.9995 Early Access. And we are continuing with Electricity, RCS, Computer and Service Propulsion. The lessons that I did previously, uh, pre-launch and boost, were basically the same as how they were before. Uh, I have done them years ago and they marked them as incomplete because they had changed them so much, they had changed things so much in general. Uh, but it, those seem to be pretty much the same. And um, now we're doing electricity, RCS, computer, and service propulsion. They might be a little bit more different, but the main differences I'm expecting are down here with the later ones, the maneuvering, burn planning, atmospheric entry, and transposition and docking. Well, mainly 7, 8, and 9. I think probably transposition and docking will be about the same. So this time we're expecting maybe some differences, but not a whole lot, but we'll see. And these systems, there's more to them than these lessons are going to cover, probably. Uh, so I'm expecting that as well, because, you know, as we actually put things to use, we are going to see some of the nuances, especially of using the computer and all the different programs that are involved. And of course, one way you can get a lot of the information about the computer is the flight manual. Uh, I have looked through the flight manu manual before, but it probably has changed. It had details on the various programs and how to access information, you know, what verb and noun you have to type in. So that is very helpful as I don't want to have to memorize everything. And of course, they actually had the their own manual on board as well for all the procedures and what they needed to type in when. Okay, good morning and welcome to the basic electrical power subsystem lesson. Please read the EPS chapter in the Apollo flight manual for more details. Most of the components in the Apollo spacecraft require power, so it's very important to understand how the electrical system works. First of all, the electrical power in the Apollo spacecraft comes from two sources, fuel cells and batteries. The three fuel cells located in the service module are the primary power source, while three batteries located in the command module are the backup power. In addition, two pyro batteries operate all systems requiring pyrotechnics, explosives. Uh, this covers staging, docking ring, etc. Both direct current and alternating current is available. DC is generated from the fuel cells and batteries directly, while AC is generated through three inverters. Most of the EPS can be configured through panel 3. So that's the... well, we already have that. And switch to, not the LEM, uh, the right hand seat and panel 3 is all this stuff so you can see the fuel cell stuff at the top and we have the fuel cell heaters fuel cell indicator the dc volts fuel cell purge uh, uh the stuff to do with the service propulsion heaters uh, ac inverters are there ac bus 1 and 2 and then the comms are down below so 4 and 5 are the circuit breakers on this side here well, 275 is over here, that's more, that's inverter power, those are the breakers. And then 250, yeah. I mean, th there's 225 there. Well, I'm sure I'll find 250 eventually. All right, Roger. DC power is distributed through two main buses named Main Bus A and Main Bus B. In addition, there are more DC buses like a battery bus, battery relay bus, flight bus, flight post landing bus, pyro bus, and a non essential bus. <laughs> All of these buses are distributing DC power to the components in the spacecraft. The Apollo flight manual has a good overview of what electrical components connected to what bus. What, uh, using fuses and switches, it is also possible to change what main DC bus a component is connected to, and it can be connected to main bus A or main bus B or both, and we've seen that during the launch we set them to A, B or both. Uh, three fuel cells are connected to the cryogenic storage subsystem. The CESS provides hydrogen and oxygen to the fuel cells so they can generate power and water. The cryogenic tanks can be mod monitored through the cryogenic tanks gauges on MDC2, and this is MDC2, and so we can see the cryogenic tank gauges there. The indicator shows the pressure and quality in the oxygen and hydrogen tanks. There are two oxygen tanks and two hydrogen tanks available, and you can see the one and two and one and two. 
The five silver oxide zinc batteries are located in the command module. Two of them are the pyro batteries and three of them are rechargeable entry and post landing batteries. The highlighted DC indicator knob is used to monitor each electrical system and we saw that in the launch one as well. So we want to set it to main bus A and then we can check the indicator volts and amps gauges and that shows the load and the voltage of the selected system. Fuel cell indicator rotational knob is used to monitor each of the fuel cells. We can set to 3 and fuel cell gauges above those uh, show the state of the fuel cell selected, both the temperatures and the flow rate. So flow and module temp. You can connect the fuel cells to either or both of the main bus A and main bus B buses. The fuel cell switches on MDC3 allow you to do this. Set fuel cell 3 to main bus A. Um, no, on main bus A to off. Okay, off. And then we have the little um, bar pole indication, meaning that the fuel cell 3 is not connected to main bus A. The three switches just below do the same before main bus B. Set fuel cell number three on main bus B to off as well, completely disconnecting fuel cell three from the electrical grid. Okay, set the DC indicator switch to main uh, fuel cell three. Look at the DC amps gauge and it should show zero as there's no load there. On MDC3, you can also control the fuel cell heaters and the fuel cell radiators. These are used to maintain nominal pressure in each of the tanks. Heaters and fans are installed in each tank. As mentioned, the heaters adjust the pressure in the tank. The fans are circulating the substance to avoid stratification. The heaters and fan switches on MDC2 control these and they are either auto, off, or on. Set O2 heaters 1 to off, which is the middle. This will turn off the heater. You can control the others as well as using these switches. As well using these switches. The three fuel cell reactant switches on MDC3 are used to open or close the reactant valves to each fuel cell. They are opened pre-launch. So fuel cell reactant switches. Where are you? Oh, well, there's fuel cell reactants here. So I guess this switch is below it are the ones or and above so H2 and O2 if they are closed during the flight the respective fuel cell is shut down there are no ways of restarting them in flight the talkback indicators are gray when open and bar pulled when closed the three rechargeable entry and post landing batteries powers the power the CM and CMSM separation after the CM sep uh, after command module and service module separation. They can also be tied to the main buses to power them if the fuel cells malfunction, but only for a brief time. Yeah, um, Apollo 13, <laughs> you know, I mean, is uh, that sort of thing. A lot of this is very relevant to Apollo 13. Uh, battery charger is available to recharge these batteries. The DC power is converted to AC power by three inverters. The AC inverter switches on MDC3 are in the lower right. Okay. Only one inverter can be connected to the same DC bus at the same time. This is prevented mechanically. Each uh, inverter can power two AC buses, but normally one inverter powers one AC bus. Inverter one can be powered by it can be powered by main bus A, inverter 2, main bus B, and yeah, we get it. Uh, okay, AC bus 1 is normally connected to inverter 1, and AC bus 2 is normally uh, connected to inverter 2, and the third is normally off. Okay, so that's the walkthrough of the basics of the electrical system, and we can look at the manual to study the electrical system on a deeper level. But you get the picture as far as what the flick switches do. So let us end mission. Now the RCS.
Okay, welcome to the RCS lesson. The reaction control system is a set of systems that control the jet thrusters used to maneuver the spacecraft in orbit. The service, propulsion, uh, service module RCS system is primarily used throughout the mission until command module service module separation. The service module RCS system consists of four identical packages or quads located on the service module. Each pack is distributed 90 degrees apart from the others. Each package has four jets or thrusters that can be fired. Each pack is named A, B, C, and D, and each thruster on the pack is named 1, 2, 3, and 4. And you may remember in the previous video we had A1, C1, A2, C2, B1, D1, and so forth. These are the thrusters. Using this convention, an object can be referred to as, for example, D3, there, uh, meaning the jet three on quad, uh, jet three on quad D. In addition, each quad has its own propulsion system. Uh, so helium is used to pressurize the quad, and so the fuel and oxidizer gets m mixed and ignited. So yeah, each quad has its own tanks. Two helium tanks exist on each quad as well as two propulsion systems. To use the jets on the quad, the helium valves need to be open, as well as the propulsion system. Eight switches on the control panel two control the helium valves on each quad. The helium surrounds the bladder with propellant. Surrounds the bladder... Oh, well, anyway, it's fine. Uh, there is one switch per quad per helium system. So set the service module RCS Helium 1 Quad D switch to the up position. This will open the Helium 1 valve on Quad D. And now it's just open. A talkback indicator indicates gray if the valve is open and barber pulled if closed. Set the switch down, and then we'll see the bar pole. That means that it is closed. Service, mo uh, service module uh, RCS propellant system works the same way, but using the A switches just below the helium controls. So helium one, helium two, primary propellant, secondary propellant. Each quad can be monitored using the RCS indicator rotator knob on this control panel. Set it to D. So we're in quad D. And then the service module RCS gauges are used. Where are we? Um, service module RCS are used to monitor the quads, including the command module systems. So you see command module RCS down here, and then the service module RCS up there. And I guess we can toggle between the two. The service module RCS in switch selects if the last gauge above will show the helium tank temperature or the propellant quantity. Set to prop propellant quantity. So here, this uh, the top will be helium temperature and the bottom is propellant quantity. And we can see 100%. Now, if it's temperature, it'd be in Fahrenheit, it looks like. Heaters are used to increase the temperature in the quad if they have been idle for a long time or it has a low temperature. The command module RCS system has 12 thrusters and provides attitude control for the spacecraft. Two redundant systems named 1 and 2 are used to control the 12 thrusters. As with the service module RCS system, helium is used to pressurize the systems. Set the CM RCS pressure switch to the up position to pressurize the CM RCS thrusters. Then the CM uh, RCS propellant tank needs to be pressurized. This is done with the two CM RCS propellant switches. Set CM RCS propellant 1 to up. Uh, CM RCS propellant. So up, up. I think. Yeah, I mean, that says CM RCS propellant 1 to up. I don't know why they didn't highlight it though. But they were barber pulled, so they weren't on yet. Notice that the propellant system 1 is now pressurized by the talkback indicator. Yeah, that's great. Last thing is to enable the CM RCS logic. This is automatically done during service module command module separation. If the command module RCS logic is enabled, if not, set the RCS transfer switch 
to use the CM RCS thrusters, which is up. Now the spacecraft is configured to use the command module RCS system instead of the service module RCS system. This is good in case of emergencies or essential after service module separation. Like, I mean, obviously Apollo 13 would be one of those emergencies where the service module uh, RCS system was not reliable and that was earlier than expected. Each thruster has a direct and an automatic coil. The automatic coil is powered by either main bus A or main bus B and is configured by the 16 switches on panel 8. So that's the 16 that we have up there that we are quite familiar with. Auto is using a system named RJEC to control the thrusters. I don't know what that means, uh, but okay. Reaction jet and engine on-off control, RJEC, is used by the SCS and CMC to trigger the right thrusters based on the commands from the control stick or the digital all pilot slash CMC. The direct coils are controlled directly from stick input, if enabled, bypassing the electrical control systems. In a navigation lesson, we'll learn how to use the RCS system to control the attitude of the spacecraft. Okay, so that's basically how the RCS works, mainly on the center panel, making sure that you actually feed the stuff into the right place. Uh, usually everything should be great, but in an emergency, things will have to be turned off kind of thing. Okay, so the computer. All right, in today's lesson, we will learn about the Apollo Guidance computer and how to interact with it. First of all, the Apollo Guidance computer is a highly sophisticated digital control computer used on board the Apollo spacecraft and in the lunar module. It provides computation and electronic interfaces for guidance, navigation, and control of the spacecraft. The AGC is used in most phases of the mission, from launch to landing. You communicate with the AGC using a numeric display and keyboard called a DISCI. Display and keyboard pronounced DISCI. Uh, located on panel 2 and in the LEB, lower equipment bay. The DISCI has an array of buttons and lights in addition to the main display. I suppose we'll just go for the DISCI view. The AGC is controlled by verbs and nouns, and they are entered numerically as two-digit digit numbers. A verb is an action that is to be performed, like changing the mi mission program, monitor data, change data. A noun is the location or register the verb is being performed on. For example, if the crew wishes to run Major Mode 11, they enter verb 37, that means action change program, and then noun 11, that means to program 11. So, AGC can run one major mode, the mission program, at a time. These are major programs and are referred to as a two-digit, referred to by a two-digit number. The major mode currently in use is displayed by the program indicator on the display. The re-entry Apollo flight manual has a complete overview of the available verbs, nouns, and programs supported in re-entry. So yeah, that's probably the most important thing you can review. Uh, I mean, it's all very important, but still. Uh, a major mode, if I, uh, very often I'll consult the manual for those. Uh, major mode can, for example, be used to prepare and execute the TLI burn setup, an SPS burn monitor and handle setup, ascent, etc. Let's try to use the computer. First of all, move the camera. Well, done that. Uh, we will set up the computer into major mode 1, program 1. Uh, this is used to prepare the IMU for launch. Verb 37. 3, 7, enter. Zero, one, and hurt, and then we're in program one. So computer is running program one as indicated by the program digits on the display up there. So the no at warning light illuminates, meaning that the IMU isn't providing an attitude as it's currently aligning itself. So you can see the light there. The FDAI will rotate to the configured launch attitude. We did this during the launch tutorial. Program 1 will automatically change to program 2. A convention is normally used when operating the computer. 
The above sequence of buttons was verb 3, 7, enter, noun 0, 1, enter. This can be shortened to V, 3, 7, E, N, 0, 1, E. Or sometimes we see them omit the N, I think. This concludes the initial AGC lesson. Oh, that's not that much. So, um, yeah. I feel like they could have just mentioned some of the other modes that we might encounter, but I guess we'll just learn them in process. So, yeah. The computer could do with a lot of reinforcement though, frankly, because just the lessons for when you're doing the stuff, we could have repetition. I mean, you can mention them at a time and then repeat the information there because there's a lot to digest there. Okay, welcome to the SPS lesson. In today's lesson, we will learn about the SPS. <laughs> yes. Uh, you are currently in a stable orbit around Earth, still attached to the S4B launch vehicle. Uh, we will first attach from the S4B, then look at the systems needed to control the SPS. This will go through the basic operations, uh, and they recommend checking, checking the flight manual. To separate from the S4B, all we need to do is press the CSM LV SEP button. Uh, it is a cover button, and you need to open the cover first. Yes, and then it's CSM LV SEP. If everything went well, you should now be separated from the launch vehicle. Uh, looks like it. So there we are, separated. Yes, okay, they told, tell us to go to the external view. Usually more steps are needed to safely do this before this lesson. This is sufficient. Go back into the cockpit and we will take a look at the different systems. Yes, I'm already there. SPS consists of helium pressurization, a propellant feed system, a propellant gauging and utilization system, and a rocket engine. The recent honorable rocket engine has a nominal thrust of 20,500 pounds or 91.2 kilonewtons and can be gimbaled using the thrust vector controls. The oxidizer and the fuel in the SPS is used to ignite and generate thrust in the SPS engine. The total propellant supply is contained within four similar tanks. An oxidizer storage tank, oxidizer sump tank, fuel storage tank, and fuel sump tank. It is pressurized with helium at 175 psi to push the substances into the engine thrust chamber. The helium valves can be controlled using the SPS, well let's get into the right hand seat. Okay, uh, can be controlled using the SPS HE valve AB switches. Set the SPS HE valve A switch to off, the middle position. The SPS HE valve talkback indicator shows if the valves are open, gray or closed barber pole, and they are both barber pulled. So set to on. Oh, that's auto. Down is on. Set back to auto. Okay, auto was up. Auto will control the valves automatically by the thrust on off logic and is the normal position. Above these controls, you will find the PUGS system found just below the SPS quantity label. So SPS quantity, and that shows you the percent of oxidizer and fuel for the service propulsion system, 99.9 .9 right now. And uh, we have the PUG mode here. The PUGS, uh, Propellant Utilization and Gauging Subsystem, is used to monitor the propellant if the, S uh, the SPS has a nominal ratio of fuel oxidizer at 1 to 1.6 initially. This is interesting. That's... Oh, I, I think that's based on mass rather than volume. Volume is closer to 1 to 1. When both the fuel and oxidizer levels are the same, the system is balanced. Ox, ox unbal gauge shows the balance of the system. If it reads zero, the system is balanced. This is the ratio between oxidizer and fuel percentage above. If it is unbalanced, the oxidizer unbalanced gauge will indicate a value either the inc or the increased or decreased uh, side. Uh, propellant utilization valves can be used to correct any unbalancing. So we have the oxidizer flow valves here. Uh, it will change the mixture ratio to balance the system. Again, the SPS engine is a restartable engine and is the primary source of thrust after S4B separation. 
There are two pairs of engine injector valves named by propellant valve system A or B. The engine is ignited by opening one or both of these and is shut down by closing the open valves. When open, the engine will throttle at max thrust for the duration of the burn. Each engine ignition requires nitrogen from the bipropellant valve system in use to start. At the launch pad, it is filled to 2500 PSI for each system. This will be needed to be at least 400 PSI for the system in use. In addition, each ignition will require 50 PSI of nitrogen from the bipropellant valve system A and or B. That's the main limitation for how many ignitions you can get out of the service propulsion system. The SBS instrumentation gauges on the upper part of the, the control panel 3 lets you see the status of the SBS system. So the HEN2 line can be selected using the SBS pressure indication switch. So we can have N2, A, N2, B, or helium. So I set this to N2, B down position. Most of the controls to ignite the SPS engine are located on the main control panel one, the commander side. And so we see the pressure there. And yeah, let's just go to the, and uh, the pressure for helium, it says, Helium on top, and it says N2 on the bottom here, so you switch between the two. Okay, main control panel one. Either or both the A or B SPS injector valve systems need to be armed to ignite the engine. The protected DB thrust AB switches on this panel switch uh, is used to... Okay, anyway, is used to arm the control logic for the engine injector valves A or B. So, here we see the delta V, oops, delta V thrust A or B, and their covered arm thrust A now. Okay, so that's armed. The launch vehicle SPS PC gauge shows the chamber pressure if the launch vehicle slash SPS in uh, switch is in PC pressure, chamber pressure, and it's usually 100 psi during the burn. So uh, if it's on the alpha, it's reading something from the launch vehicle. Uh, if it's in the PC mode, it's reading the chamber pressure of the SPS system. So we could switch it down and that'll be for the SPS system. Otherwise, it's a launch vehicle indicator. If the SPS propellant is less than 50%, the fuel might be floating around the tank due to being in free, free fall. Therefore, before igniting the engine, the propellant needs to be settled down in the tanks. This is done using the direct ullage button on this, and so direct ullage right there, or using the forward translation thrusters. We won't need to do this now. The engine is ignited in three different ways after being armed and ready. The primary method is method is to use the computer and the CMC Delta V mode using program 30 and program 40. So now we've been introduced to two more programs. The secondary method is to use the SCS and SCS DV mode. The SCS cont switch needs to be uh, in SCS and the EMS needs to be in Delta V mode or DV mode with the EMS DV range set to a number above zero feet per second. This, uh, I, I feel like maybe they should demonstrate these things and highlight these. Uh, so um, there's the SC cont switch and so that would need to be in SCS mode down there. And then EMS needs to be in Delta V mode. So let's see, this is EMS. So this is the Delta V EMS set and you increment it uh, so that it is a number above zero feet per second. Uh, to get it on Delta V mode, it's like that. And when that's set, the thrust on button is pressed to ignite the engine. So thrust on is down there. Okay. The third method is to use the SPS thrust direct on mode. This is considered as a backup mode. The SPS thrust switch is set to direct on. That's that big flick switch there. 
and to ignite the engine. So if you want to just go ahead and ignite the engine, you can just flick that up. Uh, the normal is to shut it down. The EMS can optionally be used to detect delta V changes. So we can use this to sort of count down the amount of delta V that we want. So that's the backup way. Point in the right direction and uh, flick that switch to ignite the engine and then it'll count down how much delta V you've uh, covered and then you sl flick it off. That's it. Okay, so we are actually going to try that. So, direct on. And that starts to burn. And then off. Well, in this case, it didn't really do it because... Um, oop, oop, normal. Do I, do I get to set things? I forget. Uh, hold on, let me try that again. Okay, now it's counting negative. So we did 28.7 feet per second of delta V there. Okay. All right, so that's that one. Okay, so we've completed the planned lessons. I'm sort of tempted to throw lesson seven into this video because those were pretty quick, but I'll save it for next time as planned, and if the next video is a little bit longer, that's fine. Uh, but yeah, we'll keep it to this, and I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I'll see you next time.